stand for the reading of the scripture. And these are selected verses from Isaiah. This is what the sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel, says. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. But you would have none of it. Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the word of his servant? Let the one who walks in the dark, who has no light, trust in the name of the Lord and rely on their God. But now, all you who light fires and provide yourselves with flaming torches, go, walk in the light of your fires and of the torches you have set ablaze. This is what you shall receive from my hand. You will lie down in torment. The word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Some of you may be thinking, well, that didn't sound too comforting. Let's put this all together. Uh, We're starting a new sermon series. It's going to last through September. I took requests from all of you, and uh, I'm calling it FAQ, Frequently Asked Questions, although it's not, it's like Jeopardy. It's not always stated in the form of a question, but but I'm taking your request, and this, the first one today is about this verse from Isaiah about walking in quietness and confidence. So let's look at what Isaiah wrote for us in a moment, and let's just say a quick prayer before we begin. Father, once again, this is a time when we set aside to hear from Your Word, to let Your Word speak to our hearts. Um, And so, Father, I pray every person here opens up their mind, their spiritual eyes, their spiritual ears to hear and would receive what You have for them today. Uh, Because I believe, I know, You want to speak to every heart here. Say different things to different people, whatever it is they need. So let the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Oh Lord, you are our strength and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. So these verses we just read from the book of Isaiah is the time when the people of uh, Israel were about to go through an incredibly rough period of time. They were going to be taken away from their country to an unfamiliar territory, and they would experience there the deep pangs of loneliness. They were going to cry out to God, and because of unchanging circumstances and continued periods of pain and turmoil, they are going to feel like God was unconcerned with their anguish. Heaven would seem not only distant, but even silent as well. And so in the 30th chapter of the book, we read one verse from that chapter, as God's prophet, Isaiah writes that God has given him a direct message to the people. Did you notice? He said this, This is what the Sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says, In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust, or some translations, in quietness and confidence, is your strength. Now that sounds like a great promise, doesn't it? But that isn't the end of the verse. And you probably noticed that. The next sentence says, but you would have none of it. God offers them repentance and rest and salvation and quietness and confidence and strength. But they refused His offer. And then connected to this is the same idea in the same book that we read in the 50th chapter. God tells His children to trust Him in these dark times, to trust Him in the darkness when they can't see. Instead, He says, they try to light their own way. And when they do that, they wind up in a miserable place. So God seems silent. And instead of waiting on His guidance, they try to find their own path. They try to find their own direction. I want to ask you, have you ever gone through a time in your life where God seemed silent? 
some of the greatest Christian mystics of the past. The mystics were people who spent hours and hours trying to commune with God, wanted this personal relationship, this personal experience. People like Teresa of Avila and St. John of the Cross. People who continually longed for this close, intimate relationship with God. And they would have these long periods when God seemed silent or even absent. And they would refer to these experiences as the dark night of the soul. C.S. Lewis, many of you have heard of him. And if you don't remember the name, you may know some of the books he wrote. One of the greatest Christian thinkers and writers of the 20th century began as a devout atheist. And as an adult, he came to have a deep faith in Christ. And along with the fantasy books, the Chronicles of Narnia, he wrote those. He wrote many other books and essays defending faith in Christ. Books like Mere Christianity and the Screwtape Letters. Some of you may be familiar with those. But he allowed himself, later in life, to fall in love with an American woman named Joy. And it was quite unexpected because he was a confirmed bachelor. But joy brought much joy to his life. But then she contracted cancer. And he watched her slowly grow weaker and weaker and eventually die. And he wrote a book based on that long, painful experience called A Grief Observed. And in that book, uh, this great man of faith wrote these words. Listen. Meanwhile... Where is God? This is one of the most disquieting symptoms. When you are happy, so happy you have no sense of needing Him, if you turn to Him with praise, you will be welcomed with open arms. But to go to Him when your need is desperate, when all other help is vain, and what do you find? A door slammed in your face and a sound of bolting and double bolting on the inside. After that, silence you may as well turn away. In those times in our lives, how do we cope? What do we do? Or what special knowledge do we need to respond in ways that will help us navigate through such difficult circumstances? Well, I think those verses that we just read this morning in the book of Isaiah can help us out. How can we walk in quietness and confidence and trust when God seems to be silent. So in preparing for this sermon, I turned to a book written by a man named Ron Dunn. The book's called When Heaven is Silent. And Reverend Dunn wrote the book after losing a son in death unexpectedly. And so he knows what he's talking about. And he's been through a period of sustained divine silence. So I want to thank him for his insights, and I also want to uh, give him credit pretty much for the basic outline, at least for the sermon this morning, because I thought his insights were really good. So here's the first thing. When God is silent, keep on walking. What do you do when you don't know what to do? And the answer is, do what you already know to do. Or in Isaiah's words, keep walking. What do you do when your prayers seem to stick in your throat, when it seems like God has stuffed cotton in His ears? You keep praying. What do you do when you read the Bible and it's not making much sense, or it just seems like a lot of words on a page? You keep reading. What do you do when you attend worship services and you feel empty inside? You don't have any kind of spiritual vitality whatsoever. You keep worshiping. You keep walking. Keep praying. Keep reading God's Word. Keep going to church. Keep singing praise to God. When you don't know what to do, keep doing what you already know to do. Even in the dark and the silence. When the psalmist was at his very lowest, you can read it later, Psalm 42, he's in complete despair. But he ends the psalm this way, Hope in God, for I shall 
yet praise Him. Did you get that? He wasn't able to praise God from his heart in the present because things were so bad, but he knew where his hope came from. And he knew that at some point in the future, he would be able to praise him again. Yet, I will praise him. So keep walking, keep praying, keep going in the right direction. The next thing, when God is silent, don't light your own fire. In the passage in Isaiah we read from the 50th chapter, God warns His people that in the midst of the darkness, they may want to try to light their own way. But the end of that choice, if you remember, is disaster. We see that over and over again in Scripture. Abraham found out that truth when in Sarah's barrenness, they came up with the great plan to let Hagar get pregnant by Abraham and Ishmael was born. Tried to light their own way. Moses found out by trying to kill an Egyptian and thinking nobody would find out. You know, did he think he was going to deliver Israel by killing one Egyptian at a time? He tried to light his own way. Peter found it out on the night of Jesus' arrest when he pulled out his sword and cut off the high priest's servant's ear, drawing a sword in the Garden of Gethsemane. When we don't know what to do sometimes, we try to light our own fire. And what is so dangerous about the dark is that we often get so desperate to see something happen, we take it upon ourselves to try to make something happen. Because we're beyond, we don't like periods of darkness. We don't like periods of waiting. We don't like periods of silence. And so one of the greatest destroyers of faith in most people's lives is timing that doesn't fit our preconceived notions. God doesn't act fast enough, and it hurts our faith. We live in a fast-paced world where we've come to expect instant responses to every desire and need. We watch 22-minute sitcoms. Everything's resolved in 22 minutes. We... we uh, we like to get instant cash from those little money machines, those ATMs. We like instant relief for our, our sore muscles and our back aches. We like instant access to information on the internet. It's almost we feel like our birthright to make the world jump at our demands. But God doesn't operate that way. He is never in a hurry. Oswald Chambers, some of you will know that name, wrote a great devotional years ago that many people still use today, My Utmost for His Highest. And in that book, he says that God remains hidden sometimes to teach us to trust Him more completely. And this is a great observation, I think. We sometimes mistake God's hiddenness for God's absence. I went to see the Rangers play the Astros this weekend with my two sons. It was a great experience. I always like spending time with my boys. When they were little, we played hide and seek. I'm sure you played that with your kids. You know what the thing is about hide and seek? I was hidden, but I was never absent. There's a difference. God is never absent. Matthew Henry said, that God, our Savior, is sometimes a God that hides Himself, but never a God <clears throat> that is absent. Sometimes in the dark, but never at a distance. And you know, there are some things you can only see in the dark. Ann Dillard said this, you do not have to sit outside in the dark. If, however, you want to look at the stars, you will find that darkness is required. Just remember, as the Apostle John tells us, his light shines in the darkness. And the darkness can never conquer it. The last thing we can say is when God is silent, Lean on Him even more. 
Isaiah tells us that the one walking in darkness is to rely on his God, to trust him. This, this thing about walking in confidence and strength, that, that's uh, walking in confidence, uh, pardon me, walking in quietness and confidence, that's where your strength is. It's not talking about finding our own quietness or finding our own confidence. The word confidence means trust. It means we're finding our quietness and our confidence by trusting in God. When God seems to withdraw the light, He's trying to teach us there's something better than light. And that is faith. The Bible says we walk by faith, not by sight. So when we feel like we're in the dark, when we experience the silence of God, then we must learn to change our question from why or why me, to what now? Philip Yancey, famous uh, Christian author, said this, the emphasis I see in the Bible is not to look backward and find out if God is responsible in order to accuse Him. <laughs> the emphasis is rather on looking ahead to what God can make of seeming tragedy. Many times, for us as believers, when God seems silent, the issue for us is not one of faith, but one of trust. The issue becomes for us not so much does God exist, or is God in control? The issue isn't the existence of God, but the character of God. When C.S. Lewis was going through the terminal illness of his wife. He expressed the thought this way, not that I am in much danger of ceasing to believe in God. The real danger is of coming to believe such dreadful things about Him. The, the conclusion I dread is not, so there's no God after all, but, so this is what God is really like? Deceive yourself no longer. So the ultimate question that begs an answer from all of us when God seems silent is will I remain faithful to God even though right at this moment I don't feel like God is being faithful to me? How do we respond to a God who's so powerful in times of not being able to understand the place where we are? Paul says this in the book of Romans. Oh, how great are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible it is for us to understand His decisions and His ways. For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to give Him advice? And who has given Him so much that He needs to pay it back? For everything comes from Him and exists by His power and is intended for His glory. All glory to Him forever. Amen. That's a big God. And God makes it clear. He doesn't need consultants or research assistants. God gave us our mind, and He wants us to use our mind to reason and think. But think about this. It's also true. You've heard me say this before. It's also true that if I could understand the things of God, if I could wrap my mind around His, then I would be God and He would be me. When we have reached our mental limits, all we can do is accept and adore. And at many times in life, there's nothing left to say except God I cannot grasp your mind, but with my whole heart, I trust your love. Look how Jesus dealt with the silence of his Father. Remember that last night in the Garden of Gethsemane, he cries out, he prays, Father, if it, Father, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass for me. I don't want to do this. I don't want to have to go through this. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. What did he receive? 
silence. There's no escape. There's no deliverance this time. And if you notice, as you read the story of the crucifixion on the cross, Jesus never cried out about the pain of the nails or the agony of the sword or the shame of His nakedness. This was His despair. The first word, My God, My God, why have You forsaken Me? And the answer, resounding silence. But then Jesus' final words from the cross, words of trust in the midst of the silence, beginning with these words, Father. Father, which is to say, even though I feel like You have forsaken Me, You are still My God. You are still My Father. Father, into Your hands, I commend, I trust My Spirit. When God is silent, keep walking. Don't give up. When God is silent, don't try to light your own way. Don't get so impatient you try to make something happen. And then you only make things worse. And most importantly, when God is silent, lean on Him even more. Then, and only then, you will find that in quietness and confidence, in quietness and trust will be your strength. Let's pray. Father, thank You so much for this great promise in Your Word. Help us all, Lord, to learn this truth. At times when we feel like You're silent or distant, to keep on faithfully following You. To not try to find our own solutions, which usually mess things up, but to trust You, to wait on You, and put our confidence in You. That's when we will find everything that we need to make it through. We pray this in the strong name of Your Son, Jesus. Amen.